My goal for this video is to make it the single best resource you've ever seen on the internet for addressing your own individual posture and associated movement limitations. I'm going to give you objective ways to understand and appreciate how your body is presenting the way it is today and a lot of my best tools to help you improve a lot of the associated limitations that occur when posture gets a little bit out of whack. The three big structures we're gonna be talking about today are the head, the rib cage, and the pelvis. They can all be turned to either the right or left or they could be twisted individually to the right or the left, meaning that I could have a posture where my head is turned towards the right side and my rib cage is turned to the right side and my pelvis is also turned to the right side. But I could also have a head that's turned to the right, a rib cage that's turned to the left, and a pelvis that's relatively turned to the right. And so this is more of a twisted posture. Now here's what I really think you're gonna find interesting. I'm gonna be honing in, particularly in this video, on side-to-side -side differences between the body and how these twists can occur. But you may be wondering, well, what if someone has an anterior pelvic tilt or a posterior pelvic tilt on obviously both sides because both sides would be affected with that. What I want you to appreciate is how this is happening in the first place. The human body is trying to move forward in space. That's its primary function as it relates to movement. And if we can't find a way to effectively shift in and out of our body and do what we call lateralizing from side to side and using rotation effectively, we end up creating these extended positions or slouched positions on both sides because that's what's helping us manage a lack of rotation. I know that sounds crazy, but here's someone who I was just about to do a session with. And what we did for a little experiment is we created different orthotics for each foot. We basically made them asymmetrical. So we made it so that way the orthotic was pushing her more into her left side because she was so far over on the right side and extended on both sides that when we gave her that orthotic, instantaneously without her having to think about anything. Her posture was noticeably better on both sides. And that's because we gave her the ability to create more neutrality, the ability to shift into that left side, which she was limited in. And now all of a sudden she's got way better posture. And that's not by accident. And this is why we're going to hone in on these individual differences because this is what is ultimately driving so many of these postures that we see every day. There are three different sections which have either a left or a right bias, meaning that there's six total combinations of how our posture can be twisted. And I want you to appreciate that these are relative turns. So it's not like people are going to literally present like this. It's just that these subtle little turns are going to ultimately limit our movement capabilities and can lead to a lot of these postures that can become potentially problematic. Now, almost everyone is initially biased towards being in a right shifted or what I will say lateralized posture, meaning that we are lateralized, shifted over to the right side of our body. And this is because of the natural asymmetrical presentation of the human body. There's a reason why most people are right-handed. This pattern is referred to as the left AIC pattern, which I have an entire video on how we get started in this and we're predisposed to it as human beings. I will link that video down below in the description. Now, the way, now not everyone's gonna present like they're shifted to the right. And the way that we compensate out of this initial right bias depends on so many different factors, like our lifestyle, how we exercise, how we sleep, previous injury. All of these things create environments in which we need to turn and twist our bodies in certain ways, but more importantly than anything else, posture is a representation of how we're keeping an even center of mass down the midline of our body. All different postures are just representations of how we're staying upright against gravity. For example, let's say I have a really bad right ankle sprain, so I don't want to load the right side of my body. I might shift over to the left side, but now I need to be able to relatively even myself out so I might turn to the right. Or maybe I spend a lot of time at a desk and I constantly write with my right hand. So I need to be able to get over to my right side somehow. And then my head might side bend back to the left so that way I even myself out so not everything is falling off to the left side. And this can occur for so many different reasons. I'm just trying to paint a picture of how different this can be depending on your individual circumstances. But no matter what, the underlying principle is that you will be trying to find some degree of centrality, some degree of 
evenness through your spine curves. I'm going to give you several different tests for each section of the body, but please understand that this is not a thorough analysis. This is a YouTube video that can only really be so long before I lose your attention. So I'm not going to be going over every single assessment I use with every single client. If you want significantly more detail of how these patterns arise, what they look like visually, and different exercises, I highly recommend you check out the article I'm writing alongside this video. I will link it down below in the description. It will have a lot more information there. And again, I can only keep this YouTube video so long, so I strongly encourage you, if you're serious about this, go check out that article. This chart was originally inspired by two people I have a lot of respect for. James Anderson and Mike Cantrell of Applied Integration Academy originally put together a sheet similar to this, but with their permission, I've taken it and modified it to make it make sense for this video and also other content that I use. If you want to learn more about Mike and James, I will link their information down below. They have a lot of great things to offer practitioners in particular. When my head, rib cage, and or pelvis turn towards one side and we lateralize onto one side, this is defined by a weight bearing position on this side of our body. When I'm moving through the world and I load weight onto, let's say the right side of my body, I'm going to have predictable joint actions occur. I'm going to be biased towards internal rotation at my hip. I'm going to have a higher hip on that side. I'm going to have a lower shoulder on the side that I'm weight bearing on. This chart represents the joint actions that are represented when you are turned towards one side. And that turning, again, is mimicking what would happen if we load our body weight onto that side. Let's start with the pelvis because it's easier to understand. When I am loading my body weight onto that side, my hip is internally rotated. My opposite side hip, my left side in this instance, is externally rotated. I'm going to have a higher hip on that side. In this context, I would have an easier time turning my pelvis to the right side in a trunk rotation assessment like you see here. I'll have a better straight leg raise on my right side because that is a test of internal rotation actually to a certain extent. And hip flexion will be easier on the opposite side because that's an external rotation assessment. If you wanna learn how to do these assessments perfectly, then I strongly recommend, again, you check out that link down below that has the article with all of the information you're looking for to do that properly. I will have better external rotation of my shoulder on that side. I will have better internal rotation on the side I'm turned away from because it's almost like if I'm turning my rib cage to the right, you can see how that would be easier. Also, my shoulder abduction will be better on the side that I'm turned towards. And this one's really easy to visualize. If you were to just put your arms out by your side and then turn towards one side, obviously this is gonna be easier, this is gonna be harder. Finally, at the head, if I am going to lateralize to the right, my head's gonna be turned right, but my head will be side bent to the left side, which is a little tricky. And there is a way you can assess this on your own. I usually don't like active neck assessments, but for the purposes of this video, it can be helpful. We're sitting on a surface that allows us to feel our sit bones evenly on both sides and our feet are nice and flat and grounded. We're going to take visual input out of this because that can actually alter how much range of motion you have at your neck, depending on your own individual vision circumstances. So Trevor's gonna close his eyes and just take that out of it so we strictly get the biomechanical aspect of this test. Now he's going to imagine he's rotating through a column, a vertical column of his neck, and he's gonna stop at the very first sign of tension, making sure that he isn't rotating his shoulders at all or bending his neck in any way. This is a strict horizontal turn. So notice how he is going nice and slow and he's stopping once he feels that first one or two out of 10 tension in a joint or a muscle. He's gonna go back to the middle. He's gonna to go to the other direction, really nice and slow. So you can tell he doesn't have much going right, but he has some going left. His right is harder than his left. And that's really what we're looking for here, the side to side difference. Don't worry too much, don't get caught up too much in how much range of motion you're getting. Just pay attention to what side is easier and what side is harder. Now we're going to do side bending. This one's a little harder to do because you need to make sure that your shoulders really stay neutral here. But again, keeping all the same things in place, he's gonna close his eyes, and now he's just going to imagine that he's bending, but he's just bending from his neck. So he's going to go ahead and let his neck fall to one side, and he's gonna stop that very first sign of tension, 
and then he's going to go back to neutral and he's going to do the other side, making sure that this is pretty much just a lateral movement and he's not having any torsion or he's not letting his head fall back or forward to any extent. So obviously you're gonna have an easier time turning your head to the side that it is normally turned towards and an easier time side bending it to the side that it is normally side bent to. So in a right lateralized posture, you would expect to have an easier time side bending it to the left and a easier time turning it to the right. So you can plot on this chart here all your different limitations. So for example, if I am over on the right side and I have a head that's side bent left and turned right, then I'm gonna have a harder time side bending my head to the right and turning it left. So I would plot that on the chart right here. Now the reason why there's an odd number of assessments for the rib cage and the pelvis is because everyone will have at least two out of three indicating that they are one way or the other, left or right turned at each of these areas. The head only has two because it's really Really hard to assess your head on your own but I'm including it for the purposes of this video so if you're on the fence use your head rotation not your lateral flexion as the tiebreaker if I have someone that's shifted over to the right side at their head the ribcage and their pelvis that is awesome that is an easier person to deal with and usually that person sees quicker results because they don't have a bunch of twists they have to undo this is called a intact pattern and there are specific exercises that i like for this that i will be linking down below in that article in the description as well for example you can see in this chart right here this person would be representing a right lateralized posture or a right turned posture at all three sections because even though they have one or two things that show that they're to the left two out of three at both their rib cage and pelvis are indicating the right so we're gonna go with that now if you see something like this where you have a head and pelvis going to one side the right in this case but a rib cage going to the left this person is now an incomplete pattern they are not intact anymore because they have something that's twisted to the other side and this person needs to do a little bit extra work to be able to synchronize everything because we want to create an intact pattern. We want people to be able to get over to one side entirely before then going over to the other side because things need to sync up a little bit. So I would do an exercise that gets him totally over to his right side first, then give him an exercise that would help him better shift left to fill in the gaps of what would be missing, which is an inability to shift out of his right side into his left. What's really cool about these exercises is that you're going to see instantaneous changes in the assessment results themselves. And that will tell you if you're on the right track or not. So for example, in this case that I'll be using where I have a rib cage left, but my head and pelvis are going right, then you would want to get their assessments asymmetrical to the point which represents what you're seeing in a right lateralized posture. This would be a good indication you're doing something right. Now let's talk about different variables we can use to influence the position of the head, the rib cage, and the pelvis, and how we can get them to turn towards certain directions. Because most people are going to be right lateralized, I want to use the left AIC pattern as the example, and let's just say things were over on the right side. If I wanted to get my pelvis to turn towards the left, then I would turn my zipper towards the left side. And this will help set me up to recruit muscles effectively that help turn my pelvis to the left side, such as my left adductor and other internal rotators like my glute med. And on the right side, this will help me recruit muscles that help me push out of my right hip, such as my glute max and other external rotators. For the rib cage, we can use a simple basic reach. If I reached my right arm straight ahead of me and just protracted my shoulder just a little bit, got my shoulder to move away from my spine, then my sternum would be facing the left side. You can see on Phil as he reaches this right arm forward, that's gonna turn his sternum and rib cage overall to the left. Now usually, and you saw that too right here, that the head is going to follow as well. So a right arm reach would equal a head and rib cage that is going to the other side. So that's how you would also influence the position of the head. But let's say I wanted the head to go to the right side and not go to the left too. Well, what I would do is simply just reach my right arm forward so my rib cage is going to the left, but I'd keep my head looking straight ahead. I wouldn't let my head subtly turn with that because that reach will naturally influence that. That doesn't mean I turn like this, it's just a little subtle reach. But if I keep my gaze straight ahead, 
my head will be going relatively to the opposite direction of my rib cage. And this is a very simple way that you can influence the position of the neck and the head. So let's say I wanted to get myself totally over on my left side because everything is turned right. Well, I would turn my zipper to the left, I would reach my right arm forward and my head would naturally come with me a little bit. In a more complex example, let's say I wanted to get my pelvis to go left, my rib cage to go right, and my head to go left. Well, then what I would do is turn my zipper to the left, reach my left arm forward, which would turn my sternum right relative to my pelvis, and I would also keep my head looking straight ahead because now my head would be going relatively to the left while my sternum goes to the right. Now here's the big key. Please do not, do not overlook this. These are very subtle turns. They're very subtle movements. Do not do something like this, this, and this. That, I promise you, will make everything worse. The biggest struggle I have with people is that they do too much too fast. This is a very subtle intervention. This is very neurological. This is not trying to force us into anything. We want to show the body like, hey, this is potentially a better way. I like this. Let's hang out here for a second. Let's feel safe in this position. So please keep that in mind. This is a very ideal starting point to start to untwist things a little bit. So I'm gonna give you different variables to play with depending on your individual circumstances. Now we're gonna be 90-90 sideline regardless, and we're going to have our feet in line with our knees and our hips there, and a slightly compressible object in between our thighs. This could be a pillow folded in half, or it can be a little ball like this. It's also imperative that we have the head resting in a neutral position on a yoga block, or maybe a pillow that's the perfect height for us not to be side bent to one side or the other. It's very important we have a straight line here. We also have the head stacked over the shoulders and also the hips, so we're not rolled forward or back excessively. This is essential because this, this is the starting position we're going to start to add those variables onto. If you're starting in a position where you're already turned in one direction, it's gonna throw off what you're getting out of this exercise. We're going to be laying on our side with our top side being the one we're gonna shift our pelvis towards. So if I want to turn my pelvis left because it's turned right, then I want to lay with my left side towards the ceiling. Now, we're going to also play around with the rib cage position. And we, the way we do this is with a reach. Now, if I wanted to turn the rib cage to the right, I would take my left hand and I'd put it flat on the ground and I just very slightly reach, get a little protraction of the shoulder and it's just, such a little minor amount, way less than most people wanna do. And all that little reach is gonna do is just turn his sternum towards the downside. And that would be the right side in this context right here. Now, this isn't him just totally overdoing it like that. That's not what we want. We just want a very slight, subtle little reach. So you wanna start with your shoulders stacked and then just get a little bit of that protraction or the scapula moving away from the spine. If I wanted to turn the rib cage towards the other side, then you just keep the hand right here by the side and the bottom side arm would be reaching palm towards the ceiling just a tiny bit, again, to orient the sternum towards the ceiling just a little bit. Again, please don't overdo this. This isn't this. It's just a very subtle little reach right there. Okay, now the head position is the last thing. If I want the head to go in the same direction of the rib cage, then as you reach, let's just, yeah, let's use that top arm. Let the head just very subtly follow what's going on. So as you reach that left arm, the rib cage turns to the right. The head is also very slightly going to face the right side. It's just an inch or two of a turn. It's not so much to where you're rolling like that. Please don't do that. You're not gonna get anything out of this. If you're doing the bottom side and you want the head to go in the same direction, you would just very slightly let your head come with you. Just like that, that's all you need. But if you wanted the head to go in the opposite direction of your reach, so let's say that you wanted your rib cage to go to the right, but you wanted your head to go to the left. All you gotta do is take this arm, reach it straight ahead, but don't let your head turn with it. Keep your eyes and your gaze straight ahead. Now your head will be going relatively to the left while your rib cage goes to the right. Let's try to use a basic example here. Let's get everything to try to turn towards the left side. Let's say you had a typical pattern where everything, the rib cage, the head, the pelvis was turned towards the right. So what we would do is we would take that bottom side arm and just very gently reach it so that way our sternum is ever so slightly turned up towards the ceiling. And we have our head turning with us just a tiny, tiny bit. So that way it is just an inch or two turned towards the ceiling, not any more than that. Now, we're gonna exhale first and feel our rib cage come down. The lower ribs are gonna come down. 
And all we're going to do is make sure that it's the lower ribs and we're not depressing the sternum as we do this. It's not what we want. Now what we're going to do is feeling both feet flat on the wall. We're going to inhale through our nose and shift our top knee back just an inch. Exhale very gently, just two out of 10 push down onto that ball. You're going to feel your top side inner thigh muscle adductor engage. Now we're going to hold that. Inhale through the nose very silently and softly. Shift the knee back a little further. Exhale, push down very gently, just with the top knee right there, making sure that we're just focusing on feeling that inner thigh muscle. So really the only muscular tension he feels within his body is his inner thigh adductor, maybe a little top side, left side abs, but that's it. We're not shifting the knee so far back to where the shoulder comes with us more. We should keep all this in line. It's just that the knee is coming back independently of these things moving. Now, if we can't get that knee to come back anymore, just have the intention to, and just that intention will be enough to keep that adductor muscle working. Now let's say, for example, we wanted the pelvis to go to the left. We wanted the rib cage to go to the right, but we wanted the head to go to the left. What we would do is same thing with the setup. Everything is in a neutral position to start. And we take that top arm, the left arm, and just put it on the floor. Nice gentle reach and just an inch turn of the sternum towards that downside right there. And because we want the head to go to the left, we're not going to let the head travel with the reach. We're going to keep the eyes straight ahead, our gaze forward. And that means our head is going left relative to our rib cage, which is going right. So now we're going to do the same thing. Exhale, feel the ribs come down on both sides a little bit without the sternum depressing. Now inhale through the nose, gently pull back here, just an inch. Exhale, push down very gently. You're going to feel that inner thigh muscle engage and that's it. Now the only difference here with recruitment of the abs is because he's reaching with this left side, he might feel a little bit more right side abs engaged than left, and that's okay there. Here's another different variation of that exercise that may work better for others. If you want a more thorough, detailed, and progressed approach to this type of thing, check out my beginner body restoration program. It's designed for almost anyone to be able to do, and it starts them at the easiest exercises and works them up into fully standing upright exercises. And there is an asymmetry section of that program where I talk about which specific exercises to do on which specific side to make it optimal for your needs. This next one is good for pushing out of the top side. So we want this top side to be the side that we are turned towards within our pelvis. So if we're trying to get our pelvis to go left, our right side is the top side because we're gonna use our glutes and educate them how to push out of that right side that we would be turned towards in this circumstance. So we are still 90-90. We have a very, very light band around the top of the knees because this will help us better get our glutes engaged. And we have a little yoga block or something underneath our feet, which will just help us overall push out of that side too. It'll give us just better leverage to use our glute. And we have our feet perfectly flat on both sides on the wall. We have a little pillow underneath Jacob's rib cage right here. His hip is flat on the ground, but we have a little pillow there. That's just going to allow him to keep his spine neutral. So that way it's not side bent to one side or the other. And same thing applies for his head. We have a yoga block or a pillow could also work. And we want to make sure that the head is neutral. We don't want it side bent to one side or the other. It should be perfectly straight ahead. We also have a straight line from his head to his shoulder, to his hip. We don't want him rolled forward or backwards excessively. Everything is just nice and in line there. So again, the principles are quite similar. Top side here is the side we're going to be pushing out of here. And the reaches are also going to be similar. So if Jacob wanted to turn his rib cage towards the downside, the left side, he'd put his palm flat on the floor there and he just ever so subtly reach it forward. Same principle there. And if he wanted his head to go in the same direction of his reach, then he would just let his head very subtly travel with that reach. But if he wanted his head to go in the opposite direction, he would keep it straight ahead while he gets that subtle reach. Okay, looks really good. So in this example, Jacob is going to be pushing out of his right side, turning his pelvis left. He's got a reach right here. So that's gonna be turning his rib cage to the left because his right arm is reaching and he's gonna keep his eyes straight ahead. So his head will be going to the right side. So the first thing Jacob is going to do, same thing with the other exercise, nice, subtle, but full exhale, feeling the ribs come down in the front, and he's going to make sure he's not depressing his sternum as he does it like that. Just feel a little side abs engage, 
on both sides at the end of that full exhale. All right, now feeling both feet flat on the wall here, but particularly his inner heel and first metatarsal head on this top side, he's going to slide his right knee forward about as far as it can go without losing his inner heel right here or him extending his low back. So for Jacob, he can slide about that far forward before his low back really starts to move. And then he's going to just ever so slightly lift up that knee without having it travel back. And it's probably gonna get somewhere in line with his foot, if not just a tiny bit higher. And he's gonna feel his lower glute max muscle activate on that top side. This is him educating his glute to work with his foot arch to get a push out of that side and a turn of his pelvis towards the downside. So right now, Jacob has his pelvis turned towards that down left side. And remember, if we wanted to get a reach and turn his rib cage towards the left side too, he would add that little reach right there, keeping his palm nice and flat on the ground and a very subtle turn of the sternum. And then the head position would vary too. If we wanted the head to go to the left side, his head would turn with that reach just a little bit. If not, his eyes would stay straight ahead. All Jacob's gonna do is hold this position, breathing in through his nose and out through his mouth for about five breath cycles, nice and chill. These exercises should be relaxed and all he should be feeling is his glute on the top side right there. And he might be feeling a little side abs on the side his rib cage is turning towards. So because his rib cage is turned to the left with that right arm reach, he might feel more left downside side abs. But if Jacob was reaching with the other hand, the left hand and the other hand was just down by the side right there hanging out, then he might feel more top side side abs. If you're doing the exercise right with optimal form in the way that works for you in your particular posture, you should see an immediate improvement in your assessments and how they feel. They should feel easier. You should start to see things line up in the columns that you want them to line up in. Remember, if you're trying to get everything over to one side, you're still gonna be asymmetrical, but you wanna be asymmetrical in a way that shows that you are over on the right side if you're trying to get everything to go right. If you're trying to get everything to go left, then you should present with asymmetries that represent the left side of the column. Okay, so now we're at a point where we're shifted over to one side entirely. Let's say it's the right side. So you have at least two out of three things at both the rib cage and the pelvis indicating you're turned right. Your head is showing that you're turned right as well. At this point, we want to now do exercises for the intact pattern because you are an intact pattern now. So you'd want to do things that shift you over to the left side. What we're gonna do is first make sure we can set up optimally because that's the biggest part of this, honestly. This is a really effective technique, but if we aren't set up right, then we're not gonna be successful. So we gotta make sure that we have a couple of key things in place here. The first is that we have a pillow underneath our head and it should be big enough to where we're very slightly side bent up towards the ceiling. So we have a little bit of a curvature in the neck right there. Not much at all, maybe just five, 10 degrees. It's not gonna feel like much to you, but that's an important part of what we're trying to accomplish, integrating the whole body from head to toe. We also have a little towel roll underneath the lowest ribs on the downside there. That's going to serve as a reference for you to use your abs effectively later in the exercise. It doesn't need to be much, just a little bit underneath the lowest ribs, so that way the hip on the bottom side can still be on the floor. A common setup mistake we will see with this is people will oftentimes have that bottom side arm up there and shrugged, whereas if we're gonna get a little bit of separation right here and we want to use our left abs like we will in this exercise, then we want to have that left shoulder tucked under us a little bit, at minimum stacked with that top shoulder right there. We also have a bench or some object, it doesn't matter really what it is, as long as it's keeping you in a position of slight abduction, meaning that your foot is ever so slightly higher than your hip. Now, you could use a slightly higher or lower surface depending on how much abduction you have in your hip, and you can measure that separately on your own, or we may do it for you, but the point is, is that you need to have a straight line from your heel to your hip, to your shoulder, to your head. Now, for most people, because you're in a hip extended position, it's gonna feel like your leg is a little bit behind you, but in reality, it is actually just in line with your body. Now, this left side or the downside, whatever side you're doing it on, is gonna be, if this was a perfect 90 degree angle right here from his hip, he will have slightly less than that. And 
The important part of this downside is that we have some sort of external reference or object for the foot to be against something. So we have this step right here, it's up against the wall, so that way when Pre Trevor presses his heel into it, he can feel a little bit of grounding and foot reference there. It's not 100% necessary if you don't have any way you can set it up, but it, it does really help quite a bit. So if you can set it up, awesome. If not, then there might be a way you can do it without that aspect. So what we're gonna do to start is first make sure we have that straight line from the right heel or top heel to the head. Now Trevor's gonna just get a nice gentle exhale through his mouth, fully, full, maybe five to six second exhale. He's gonna feel his rib cage just come down. That's gonna stack his ribs over his hips. Now what he's gonna do is just very gently roll the right hip forward. So that way now everything is aligned still, but this right hip is square and parallel at the wall ahead of him. So he's not rolled out, but not so far to where it's not parallel anymore. Just right about there. As he does that, he should feel a tiny bit of his right outside hip, like his glute med engage. And then we're going to further facilitate that by getting Trevor to reach this right leg away from him. And that's going to have him also get the inside edge of his foot pushed away, which is E version of the foot. So Trevor, if we can show them one more time, this action right here is what you're looking for. Okay, to summarize, we have a straight line from the heel to the hip, to the shoulder, to the head. At this point, all we should really feel is the right outside hip and potentially a little bit of side abs as well. Because if you notice, Trevor, you can come back to the starting position right here. As Trevor reaches that right leg away from him, he should be able to feel a little mouse tunnel underneath these lowest left ribs right here. And if he needs to push his top hand into the ground a little bit, that's okay. And that should help him find a little bit of left obliques or downside obliques. And this is the first step of the exercise. All you need to be able to do is maintain that straight line and feel your downside side abs with your top side glute meat or side of the butt cheek. And if you can do that, great. Just sit here for a couple of breaths. Breathe in through your nose, out through your mouth, making sure you're keeping heel contact on this object right here with your downside foot. The most common mistake in this version of the exercise is that as people roll that top hip slightly forward and reach this leg away, they're gonna move through their low back and extend their low back. Remember, we are in hip extension, but we don't want the back to arch. So if this is you, I'd strongly recommend further emphasizing that full exhale at the beginning and feeling your ribs come down and holding that as you roll that hip over very subtly and slightly and then reaching that leg away from you. Doing that should really limit how much movement you have through your low back. So I hope that was helpful guys. Remember that I kept this video a little bit more condensed. The article has a ton more information if you wanna check that out. But I hope that's helpful and it really starts to shift your perspective into what posture truly is representing and what we can do to really address the root cause.